Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Wendy Yee. I'm Chris Yee. I'm Mike Delicio. And today we're taking a look at the first game in Shel Phil Shem Phillips' third trilogy. First game, third trilogy, same one half of designers. Yes. Uh, Wayfarers of the South Tigris, in case you didn't read the title of this video. Um, although, I said this to Chris earlier, and I'm sure Michael disagreed, but I felt like this didn't need to be a new trilogy. I mean, so the first trilogy, the North, sea. North Seas, mm -hmm. and the second trilogy are very different types of games. The first one, it's a Euro, but it's a fighty Euro, and then shipwrights and whatever. Mm -hmm. Then the, the trilogy of West Kingdom is a bunch of Euro games. Very mm -hmm. much... No, yes. they're Euro games. No, no, I'm not, okay. I, I, I'm not pushing back on that. If this all. had been the fourth one, I would have been like, got it. Okay, I, I get that, but I believe that the idea behind this is that they explore different mecha uh, mac mechanics. So this is going to be yeah. focusing on dice, I believe. These three games, I think, are focusing on Oh, is that the dice. case? Yeah. I believe that's the idea. Where you had the corruption track in the last trilogy? Yes. Mm -hmm. That was so like, you was could the, be good, you could be bad. What was the thing in the first one? Vikings. But, yeah, <laughs> the first one was probably the, the least... Connected. They also have similar characters, like the art gets very sure. tied in together. I'll say this. If you like the last three, you'll like this, I think. I, I feel like that's burying a Burying the lead, Tom Vassell. That's not burying the lead. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying that's necessarily bad or good. I'm sure. just saying I, I felt like they have their niche now. If you want to go down that route, before we even get into the overview, folks, I'll be a little more specific. I'll say if you really liked Paladins, if you liked Paladins the most. Ah! <laughs> this is closest to that. Yes. Complexity, that weight. In and fact, I keep calling it Paladins on accident. <laughs> you called it Endless Winter a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep All calling right, it well, the wrong Mike name. Mike is going to show how to play the game. Here we go. Okay, here we see Wayfarers of the South Tigris. As you can probably make out from the table spread here, this is a relatively involved, at least midweight Euro game. So I want to just state right off the bat that this is not an intensive rules overview by any means. This is a high level overview to just give you an idea of what the game is about. In the game, you're going to be a car cartographer thematically. You're going to be acquiring four different actually five different types of cards that you're going to be placing in your player area in front of you. Everybody starts with a player board, those are all the same, and then you're adding cards to either side depending on the type of card. So you will be exploring lands, and so these are your land cards that you put over here to the bottom left. You'll also be exploring water areas, and those are going to be represented by these water cards that you put off to the right. And then above those, you've also you're exploring space, and so you put the space cards above. You have to have a card below to place a space card. You can't just have it sitting out here on its own. All right, to be gaining these cards, to be acquiring these cards, you're gonna be gathering some tags. For set collection, that's gonna be where you're getting a lot of points at the end of the game. But mechanically, on your turn, you're gonna be doing one of three things. You're gonna either be placing a die, placing a worker, or resting. Those are the three things that you're going to be doing. So let's just talk about each of those three things quickly in turn. You start the game off with three dice, and you can acquire two more throughout the course of the game that are just over here by these minarets. When you place a die, you're going to be placing it onto either your central player board here or onto cards that have a dice spot. Not every card has a dice spot. As you can see, this one does not. But every other card in my tableau does, which you can see right here. One other thing you might notice is that many, actually on mine, all of them have some type of a requirement, some type of a tag that you need to have access to to be able to place a die in that spot. This area of your player board is known as your caravan, and this is where all the numbers of the die are represented, and you start the game with access to a camel tag on your number one die and a telescope on your number six die. Throughout the course of the game, you can gain access to other symbols that you're going to be placing there, and you're oftentimes going to want to do that, primarily through these upgrade tiles. If you see along the board, there's a number of different types of upgrade tiles. Some of them, like these special pink ones or purple, don't give you any kind of a tag, but they give you point, or don't give you any type of a um, resource you can use to place a die, but they give you a secondary tag and points at the end of the game. 
Others, like this one here, will actually give you a particular symbol that you can use. So if I were to place this one right here, now on my number two die, I have access to a falcon. So if I wanted to go to this spot and I had this number two die, I could place it there because I have access to that falcon on the number two. There are also certain cards that you can get that will give you some uh, of those symbols as well. So, for example, if you look at this townsfolk card here, this is a vagrant, you can see right there it's got a camel. If I were to slot this underneath this spot right here, which I'm trying to do neatly, not succeeding, but you get the idea. You slot it there. Now this is saying this die needs to have a camel, but I've already got one there, so now any die can go there. All right. So these upgrade tiles go into your caravan. When you're placing a die, you are looking at any symbols that you might have, you're placing it in a, an appropriate spot, paying anything, and then doing the associated action. That's placing a die. You also have workers that you start the game with a blue and a yellow, but throughout the game you can gain them through either acquiring a card with a worker on it, or along this journal track you can see that there are some green workers. So let's say that I had one of each of these at this point in my turn, I could then place one of these workers. When you place workers, what you're doing is you're placing them on cards along the outer edge of the player, the central player board, the journal track, all right? Here are our land cards, here are our water cards, here are our townsfolk cards, our space cards, and our inspiration cards. You might notice on some of these cards you see these little what look to be wooden asterisks. Those are influence that you can place onto cards throughout the game. The main significance of that is that if you want to interact with a card that has uh, one of those influence on it, you have to pay the person who owns that influence either one silver or one provision. Those are the two main resources that are in the game, silver and provisions, all right? So when you place a worker, it tells you what type of worker can be placed there. You're looking at these spots that are associated with the card. So this needs either a green or a blue worker, and then you can do that associated action. So I could put either one of those on there. You could not have two blues, two greens. You could have one of each, all right? Um, so that's placing a worker. Placing it on the card, paying anything if there is an, a, um, a marker on it, and then taking the associated action. So placing a die, placing a worker, or you may also rest. If you can't play, uh, place a die or a worker, uh, or you just don't want to, you can rest. When you rest, you see how much dice is left in your supply. If there is zero or one, then you get to activate any resting ability. So throughout the game, you may have gotten a resting ability. Here's an example of one right here, this guardian. This is saying if you have zero or one die, uh, on your turn and you're resting, you can get yourself two provisions, all right? So you would activate any of those that are applicable and go ahead and rest and you retrieve at that point uh, your dice, you get to re-roll them, and then you've got uh, all of your dice ready for you for your next turn. Okay, so in addition to either placing a die or placing a worker, resting, you also are going to be placing influence not only on cards, but you have these three guilds that you can gain influence in. Not only do they count for a majority scoring at the end of the game, but they allow you to take a free action on your turn by spending one of the influence in the associated guild. So let's say I had a couple here too. If I were the purple player, you could take your action and then either before or after whatever action you take by placing a die or a worker, you can spend one influence from that particular guild to do whatever the associated action is. This one gives you a, a boat symbol, which you might need to place a die. This one is gonna allow you to manipulate dice. And this last one is allowing you to do a journal action. And that's something that I want to point out because that is going to be really the trigger for the end of the game is moving along this central area of the board by taking journal actions. Okay. So journaling, as I said, could either be something free that you get by spending one of your influence in that black uh, guild, or some cards will give you a journal action here as well. You actually start with one on your board. So there's always a possibility for you to do a journal. To move along the journal track, you have to find, look at what the requirement is to move into the next spot. So let's say I'm the purple player, I can either go to this spot or this spot, you're moving to the right. But you have to have the associated either cost or tags. So if I had two stars tags and I took a journal action, I can move here, I'd then be able to pick up one of these special upgrade tiles and put it anywhere I want. 
if I covered up a particular uh, item on there, I would go ahead and get that too. In that case, I would get a provision, all right? As you're moving along this journaling track, if you pass one of these green workers, if you're the first one to do it, you would get that. At the, to trigger the end of the game, the first person to go into one of these rightmost spots will do that, all right? So if I were the first one to go to this spot, for example, by having one of these costs, I would trigger the end of the game. Once that end game is triggered, everyone gets a final turn, uh, one last round, and then you go to final scoring. There are a number of different things that you're gonna be looking for for final scoring, but as I mentioned at the beginning, primarily it's gonna be about collecting sets of different tags on cards that you have in your tableau. You're looking for different amounts of the same or four of uh, unmatched to get the associated points that you see here. You also are gonna get points based on your space cards. And these are, again, usually associated with tags and with these space cards, you may potentially be putting uh, some inspiration cards. These are tough, tough to get. You don't get these much throughout the game, but when you do, you slot them above one of the space cards you think you've got a chance of fulfilling at the, by the end of the game, and if you do, it'll double whatever the associated scoring was for that particular space card. You also are gonna get any VPs from points in your caravan, and then three victory points for the person with the most influence in each guild. All right, well, again, that's a high level overview of Wayfarers of the South Tigris. Let's head back over and let you know what we think. As I always have to do with these kind of reviews, I would like to say I like the game a lot. <laughs> also, tell us how you really feel. Mm -hmm. Also, well, uh, the, uh, with these kind of games, you have to clarify. I didn't teach all the rules, of course. Oh, in the overview, oh, I mentioned it great. actually at the beginning of the overview, I mentioned that it was just a high level. Good. Minor. Minor complaint about the. I think the components are great okay. for the most mm -hmm. part. Um, I love the art. I especially love the art of the planets. The space cards, yeah. Yeah, the Those space cards. Cool. Mm -hmm. I really like this. This is like my favorite of all the games that he's done so far. This is my favorite art wise. Of, I think of the Miko's art. Really? Yes. Wow. Yeah. It's, I well, think I it's, like his Vikings people best. Yeah. But I love this backgrounds and stuff. Yeah, that's the biggest distinction, I think, is that this one is focusing less on the characters because those characters, those townsfolk cards, as soon as you get them, you slide them under co other cards. You don't that's even see true. that anymore. That's true. You don't see it very this much. This is all about, because thematically you're kind of cartographers, you're, you know, you're, you're exploring lands and seas and the skies and the heavens and, you know, you have this kind of, yeah, landscape in front of you. I think it makes a really good, yeah, display. Yeah. The, panorama. Exactly. That's yeah. the word I was Yeah, the cards all fit together on, on the edges nicely, mm -hmm. and so it's a good thing that the space and the landscapes look the best, because they look great. I think it's really easy to score if you're scoring those for your endgame scoring stuff. Mm. It's very easy to see, too, like, these are where the planets are, these are where the, the, sh the sea things and the underneath stuff. It's very easy to count all of that, because yeah. it's... It has specific locations. Well, I agree with all of that. All of this beautiful, gorgeous looking, maybe my favorite too, artistically. The downside is that it's a tremendous table hog, much like Paladins was. Uh, you're going to need a lot of table space because you've got a large central board, as you saw in the overview, and then every player has a pretty wide display in front of them as well. Yeah, and unfortunately, you don't know how to center that. That doesn't bother me, but that might be because we've been playing so many table hogs sure, these days. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. My only complaint about this is a minor thing, but it bugs me a lot, is his icon for discounts okay. um, that he used. I think he might have used this in his last game, too. Is that the one with the little, like, line through it? Like the, Yes, okay. and it almost looks well, like you have to you pay, pay a coin to do something. Mm -hmm. But no, it means it's minus one or more coins to right. do it. As a small X. It has the coin symbol and a small That's red That's the X. X. The different yeah. one, yeah, the pay one is the line through. Yes, okay. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that because I, one of my kind of consistent things that I like about the, the, the games that Shem Phillips and, and now S.J. McDonald in, in, get involved with is that the consistent iconography, and I think it's some of the best in the business. I must say though, and, and Chris will know this, the first game I played of this was with Chris. I struggled a bit with some of the iconography. There's so much of it. This uh, is 100% icon soup. Because you have, you have cards and tiles now as icons. You have yes. primary iconography, you have secondary iconography, and the icons really are what drive this game. I mean, it is all about you know, having particular alignment of those. And so I did struggle a bit 
it became less of an issue the more I played it, but I, I, I was a bit overwhelmed visually the first time I played it. I think a few of them are not his best icons. Mm. Um, I, th I think that there, there was a card that showed like the, the one, one to three uh, meteorite, the comets yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and some of them just aren't as ex well explained. I think the rulebook is overall pretty good. It is, yeah. Uh, he does a good job rule books. He does a good job with icons. But I think this is the first time that we had a lot of questions at the end of, uh, you know, at the end of the read and the teach. Yeah. And it, it's just a little bit trickier. I, w I wish that there was a little more explanation of, like, what does this symbol mean? What is, how do these exact moments interact? And let's bang that drum again. A player aid card wouldn't have been the worst idea in the world. Come either. on! <laughs> sure, sure. But, but everything was listed in the rule book. 100%. You could look it up very easily. Like, yes. I don't feel like that was a huge stumbling block no. for me. Where it was a stumbling block for me is, and this is going to go into something I really like about the game, I love that this game offers you so much choices. Oh this is a feast yeah. for Odin game in a sense. Yes. It's like you can do a ton of things. That being said, I would often forget that things had costs and stuff yes. because they were buried in the board. I'd be like, oh, I'm definitely taking that. Oh, my word, that cost three coins. I forgot about that. You know, because it's like it's on the board here that you're putting together and points to the stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's just so much iconography. Also, when you move on this main board here, Got to make sure not to cover stuff up um, so that it isn't for other people. I'm not yeah. I'm I'm checking fingers the, I'm at checking anyone the in rule book. Eric Summer. Yeah, I'm checking the rule book as we talk because I wanted to say that he may have put something in here about, because that is true. It's very easy to forget. That would be like an easily forgotten rules thing okay. is that, you know, you the, the, the costs that are involved. All I think they may have files. mentioned it in the but rule But not book. everything has a cost. Not everything. And yeah. sometimes the cost right. is down here. If I take a land thing, yeah. it's just the two... Provisions. Bags of provisions, right? Yeah, yeah. But if I'm doing space, there's money costs money up cost, there. Money costs, sure, yeah. But anyway, that's the thing. Yeah. It's going to be overwhelming first teach, I think. I agree. I think that, that, yeah, this is a game that the more that you play it, the less you're thinking about the cognitive load of, of things, how things work, and you're more thinking about those incredible choices that you have in front of you. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the tremendous variety in the game, the... the the various ways that you can kind of go for, for you, you know, you can rush the, the journal track, and if you do that, everyone else is gonna have to react to that. Uh, you can, you know, make the game go much longer, which is one of my things that I like. I've mentioned this in a number of my other reviews. Dragging a game out? No, not, not dragging a game out, because <laughs> one person can't drag the game out. Yes. Everyone would have to. Yes. What yeah. I really like games where there's player-driven, you know, not a set number of rounds, uh, when it's done well, it's one of my favorite things, and it's done very well here. I really like that tension of, yeah, you may want to just get this big, huge, sprawling display, but if someone else is pushing that journal track, you have to ac account for that. But that journal track is also not something that you can just constantly move up on. No. You have to build up your engine to be able Correct. to move on that. So you're like, oh, I got all these planets. Great. I move one space. Now I need something totally different. Right. To increase in. So I like that that has a balance too so that someone can't just be like, haha, game over, nobody got points. And a nice uh, complimentary point to that uh, is that if someone rushes the journal track, that's not a guarantee of points. Not at all. You have to yeah. be having a competent engine and scoring engine that you're building up and rush the journal track. Mm -hmm. So I think that a game's going to move typically at a good clip for everyone, but if you do see someone finding a really clean path that they can just zoop through, Get some scoring cards. Yeah. And then you'll be set. I do have to say that this game does what I appreciate with dice because I'm not a huge fan of just rolling dice and see what happens. I love that you roll dice and then you make choices. Yeah. And that is the way I want to play a dice game. Yeah, I don't even know if I, I mean it is a dice game. I just don't think much about the dice really. I mean, yeah, they're they, just a randomizer one, and then you make decisions. In this game, I know, just specific. No, in this game, I'm saying mm. you roll the dice and then they become workers to me. I, I, oh. I, I do. No, I know you manipulate them or not, but you don't roll them a ton in this no, game. No, you don't. It's really no. only when That's, you rest. But I was going to get to the to you know many of these uh, games, the 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 West Kingdom, the whatever. They have some kind of a hook, right? You know, architects. What you start with all your workers, and that the more workers you place, the stronger it gets. Raiders place one, pull one. To me, the hook in this game in Wayfarers is that kind of caravan area where yes. you, where mm -hmm. where you add that's the symbol. That's awesome. Isn't that neat? I don't. I'm trying to think of another game that's done something like that. I don't think I've seen one. I don't either. It makes me think of space space as you're like increasing 
where the dice numbers sure, are. I, I mean, so. it's not the same, but yeah. it has that feeling of like, do I want to spread wide and make everything right. a little bit better, or do I want to really focus in on one number and say, hey, I'm going to try to get everything to lead to number three. Especially since you can manipulate dice to become threes. Right. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And when you roll for a round and you say, I rolled two, 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 five. Well, I'm going to do this upgrade action. I guess I'll upgrade my twos, <laughs> right? Because that's going to be great this round. Yeah. But it's also still great in future rounds if yeah. you don't roll yes. twos. I will manipulate things into twos. I will right. make an upgrade. I can subtract a three to a two. Fantastic. And I yeah. don't feel like it's too hard to get those manipulation no. benefits. No. And if you don't use them, they're end game points mm -hmm. for majorities. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is. There's a lot of really good things going on. There's a few minor things that bugged me. Okay. Okay. Um, and it, I can't. I have to feel like I keep saying I like the game, but <laughs> I Tom thought the game. worker concept was awesome. Mm -hmm. Put a worker on a card, yeah. then if someone buys that card, they get the worker. Yeah. I was a lot less enamored with it with the prolific number of icons that let you just pull workers off cards. Ah. That made that mechanism less interesting to me than if you can just pull workers off cards. That was less cool. I also would have cut completely out of the game if I was developing to put a little X on the, the card influence. so that if someone buys that card, you get they have to pay you one extra thing. I felt like that was a lot of work for who cares. I very much agree with that. I think the influence on cards is much ado about almost nothing, right? You have to pay a silver or a provision. It's, it's annoying. It's and sometimes annoying. it will stop you from doing an right. action, but for me as the benefit, it's not, it's not that great either. Right, because the, the influence on the guilds, on those minarets, that's impactful, right? Those Absolutely. once per yes. turn, you can do one of those free actions, you know, once mm -hmm. each, I guess, if you if you wanted to really, you know, uh, kind of chain them together. That's impactful. And I also like the push-pull of, yeah, you can spend one of those to do that free action, but now you're less likely to win the majority at the end of the game. You know, it's only three Although points. Although I would not argue, I would spend them. Spend them. Yeah, because it's nine points max. Maybe on last turn you right. spend yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, right. But, but it's a nice thing. You have to consider it at least, right? So I agree with you. I think the influence on the cards is probably not as impactful. I think it's a way to add more interaction sure. because it's not a super interactive game. The biggest interaction is I took something you wanted. Right. And so I, I'm okay with it. I agree that if it wasn't there, I would be completely fine. Yeah. I did mm -hmm. really like the closed economy of the meeples, though. Mm -hmm. And it didn't mm -hmm. bother me that you could take stuff off of cards because I think you had to make that choice of, do I want a color? Do I want, am I going to go to that card anyway? So is it worth taking that meeple off now if I can get that card and the meeple at the same time? Right. I'll use it on something else. So I, I enjoyed the way that that all panned it out. It matters the, more in a multiplayer game. I'm sure. Also, the decks of cards for each area are so big mm -hmm. that you will see a lot of swing between games. The The game that you were talking about, that had more card abilities than I've ever seen before where you could just get a worker off sure. of a card somewhere. Got I've it. seen other games where it doesn't happen basically at all. You have to use one of your baseboard actions. You're like, no, I'll journal instead of grab a meeple. Mm -hmm. Journaling is way better. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it's it, that's both a good and maybe... Um, not even a negative, but just like a, a thing to watch out for. Sometimes those planet cards, or the space cards, you'll get planet after planet after planet. And then sometimes you're like, oh, I get a planet card, and not another one will show up for the whole game. Mm -hmm. it, the, the decks of cards are just that thick. So it's, it's, it's variance from game to game, but also a, a, a small degree of unpredictability. You can't say, this is the strategy I'm going to go for from the beginning. It's very reactive to what comes out. Would you have rather had decks of cards that had different player counts where you pulled cards out for lower player counts? Or are you adding them in for higher? I, I mean, I don't want to mess... I don't want to make <laughs> more setup. Because it already setup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So. yeah. Also, yeah. Well, like with many games, I might say, play with th two or three. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, it's not bad with four. It's just going to be longer. longer yeah. mm -hmm. I'm giving this one an eight. Mm -hmm. Even though I had, like, these little niggling problems with it, and also, the, what's those cards that double the bonuses? Inspiration cards. Yeah, I Inspiration. can't get those to go off to save my life. <laughs> They're, but, very um, <laughs> They're very hard. They're very hard. All that all that pales besides the fact that I'm having fun while playing it. Mm -hmm. The thing I would compare this to most is the rolling right game that made Hadrian's Wall. Oh, interesting. When I play Hadrian's Wall, I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm having fun. Yeah. That's how I feel in this one. I mean, I know what's going on. Right. But it's hard for me, as I was moving down the track, I was like, oh, I should have moved a different way. Man, nah, still having fun. Yeah. You know, I'll just yeah. figure out how to right. go this way. And yes, I know that you can, you're not Tom Vassell, you're going to play a more strategic, better <laughs> game than me, 
But if I'm enjoying myself when I'm done, I look at my board and I'm like, I came in last place. But look there's, at the stars still, I build. Yeah, look right. at the land I build. That feels good. And for that, that that's enjoyable to me a lot. Mm -hmm. So eight for me. Nice. I'm giving this a nine. I I love games, like you said, Feast for Odin, where it just you have so much to explore and every game you can kind of lean into a different thing. And I think that's super fun. I also really love engine builders. And so this is just everything that you add to your little tableau or your landscape or whatever you want to call it, like it builds your engine. It increases more. You get stronger. You get to do more. You get cooler actions. You get discounts. So I love just all of that that's going on. I'm also giving this one a nine. I have so much fun with it. I have a, f you know, a few of those issues, like I mentioned, where sometimes you'll have a game where you can get a lot of those inspiration doubler cards lined up really well, and other times where you, you look at the lineup of it when you're, when you're due to get one and you say, I will not get a single one of these to fire off this game, and that's okay. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's so much fun. I could play this very strategically. I could play it just kind of flying by the seat of my pants and seeing what I get, and both ways are really fun, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so this is one that I'm going to keep coming back to. I think it's really good. I love, as a small note, the, the there is some thematic integration. There's some idea that they did a lot of research into paying homage to this idea. So it, it's not, uh, there's an acronym people use, JACE. Yeah. Just another soulless euro. Yeah, it's not that. And it is, it, it would be easy for this exact game to just be a soulless euro, mm -hmm. but I don't think it is. I think that that idea of the exploration, the planets, the, the stars, mapping all that stuff, that's what matters. You could build a great landscape, you could get a bunch of upgraded dice and stuff, you can move up that journal track as much as you want, points are in the planets, points are in the space cards. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that, it gives it some more character than just another heavy euro game. Yeah, I, I like the game a lot. <laughs> also giving it a nine. Uh, if you're talking about just the base games, you know, of, of this kind of line of, of games, um, Paladins is my favorite of the base games. This very much is in line for becoming my favorite of just the base games. I don't think we need any expansions, by the way. It seems pretty good. Just saying. It's there, a big enough box, right. though. Either. There will no be accent. expansions, but I agree with you. This feels like a fully and complete game. I, gosh, I could have said that about Paladins, too, to be honest yeah, with you. As well, I feel that way about Paladins. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, this, 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 this game, I think, has the potential of, of becoming my favorite of the base games. It's just got everything I love. It's got a lot of player agency. It's got, you know, again, with you, maybe my favorite uh, example of the art in the game, uh, in, in these lines of games. Um, just so many options. You know, again, it feels overwhelming at first. If you can kind of, you know, just work your way through, it has just so much to offer. Just a, a tremendous game. Well, there you go, folks. That's Wayfarers of the South Tigris. I can never mm -hmm. remember the name. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Wendy Yee. I'm Chris Yee. I'm Mike Delicio. And that's the sky, the stars, I guess, something like that.